Hi there. Um, thanks very much once again for watching the uh, Explaining History YouTube channel. Um, this video is obviously going out exclusively to patrons of Explaining History First. Um, if you recall, a few weeks ago, I was talking about conservatism and the, the crisis that it's in at the moment. You, you might think it's strange as I refer to it as a crisis because conservative parties are in the ascendancy in Great Britain, um, the Conservative Party. Um, and despite uh, having lost the, the White House uh, in America, uh, Donald Trump increased his vote share. Um, he uh, has managed to pack, pack the Supreme Court and uh, uh, federal courts with conservative judges. And there is a, a mass movement um, that is kind of behind him looking to return him, if assuming he hasn't died in the meantime, to the White House in 2024. Well, the reason why I described it as a crisis of conservatism is that the, the, sort of the general principles which we associate with conservatism, um, the uh, a uh, scepticism about revolutions and, and radical political change, and a uh, defense of the institutions of state, um, the army, the judiciary, the civil service, the police force, um, uh, and the, these sorts of things. These have been uh, undermined uh, in an unprecedented way in the last four years, not by uh, uh, enemies of the state, but from, from within, by the political forces that are dedicated to, to preserving it. Um, why this is, is a kind of a, a matter for debate, but my, my general theory goes at something like this. But at a certain point, um, the uh, institutions of state have come under pressure from a, a variant, uh, a kind of a strain of conservatism, which has really embraced right wing nationalist populism um, that has uh, gauged the, the public mood, the, the angry public mood since 2008 um, as being uh, resentful of authority, resentful towards those in power, uh, suspicious and mistrustful of, um, of society's elites, uh, and has, has kind of piggybacked on, on that, has presented um, one faction of the elites as being uh, anti-elite, uh, and has um, then weaponized that uh, against more moderate strains of conservatism. Donald Trump himself, uh, you, you know, we, we can't ascribe to him uh, any any kind of level of political nous on, on, on that level. That's a, a kind of a, a, a raw cunning, perhaps, but um, certainly not not that degree of strategy. But there are people there to kind of help him with with that sort of thing. So the crisis of conservatism comes really from this um, strain of the this this kind of this elite civil war that we see, where. The, the kind of the, the founding principles of conservatism, as 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 mentioned, um, uh, and the the kind of the mid-century conservatism, which allowed for a degree of social of a kind of pluralism and, and a degree of uh, equality and a, a degree of kind of egalitarianism, um, and, and required in most West countries in the Western world prior to the advent of neoliberalism, uh, a sort of fairly well catered for and well rewarded um, lower middle and working class. Well, that's that's all gone. That was um, devastated by the experience of um, Thatcher and Reagan, uh, that phase of conservatism. Um, what I want to talk about today is this strange phenomenon of the neocons. Now, talking about the neocons is, is interesting at the moment because they had a hold over Washington in one guise or another between Nixon and George W. Bush. Um, they continued under the Obama years, the, their, their influence was so great and the legacy of their ideas for better or for worse was so great, largely for worse, in fact, almost in every conceivable way for worse, um, that, um, the, the kind of liberal interventionism 
um, the, uh, the, the uh, spreading of democracy uh, via uh, drone strike continued and abated under the Obama years. So they, they've had a huge, huge influence. And the uh, experience of, of Trump really has, has been one of the few things that seems to, if not have thwarted them, but at least to have kind of slowed down their, their advance. Um, Trump appeals to a, an angry white American nativism uh, that um, has little interest in, for example, the politics of the Middle East and simply sees uh, it as a source of um, American uh, blood and treasure being shed, which is, you know, a, a, a compelling argument for. But anyway, let's talk about the neocons and who they were. So um, neoconservatism is a phenomenon that has been developing since the end of the Second World War. Um, during the 1950s and 1960s, there were a body of mainly Democrat supporters, um, people who looked at um, the, the nature of the, 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 the Cold War and actually believed that um, a percentage of a portion of the Democrat Party was too, too soft, too moderate, too weak, too willing to listen to the new left of the 1960s, uh, to willing to uh, retreat from the Cold War, too willing to uh, look for, for peace treaties, too willing to um, criticize uh, uh, America. From the Truman Doctrine onwards, the idea that uh, um, America was a muscular democracy and a muscular advocate for democracy and that wars in the interests of democracy must be waged around the world became a kind of a, a new article of faith. Um, the uh, Truman Doctrine itself was a piece of sort of political theatre by Truman. He knew that many Americans didn't want to wage wars, um, didn't want to have the experience of hot wars again after 1945, and who wanted to stay largely out of the world's affairs. Um, Truman essentially said, you know, we're facing this existential threat from communism. We must, uh, the British, they're not going to be able to step up and aid uh, Greece, so we're going to have to do it. Uh, and then from that moment onwards, a, a kind of a modus of uh, American uh, militarism uh, that had not been completely um, cemented during the Second World War, but definitely was after the Truman Doctrine, that was born. Uh, and it, it said that, as the Truman Doctrine does, that wherever a democratic power is threatened with uh, being overthrown internally or externally, then America will intervene uh, materially in basically any way uh, that it, it sees fit. This um, appealed to, uh, as I said, a portion of the Democrat Party and a significant chunk of Republicans um, who looked upon uh, America's ideological mission in the world as um, the, uh, the, the as, as having the role of spreading uh, liberal democracy and free markets but it was understood that this could not be done peacefully and that war must be waged in the interests uh, of the these, these kind of values um, the um, relationship between America and its its allies um, was shaped uh, very much in this way. Uh, America's um, chief agents in Europe, in South America, uh, in the Middle East and in Southeast Asia. America, uh, American foreign policy was, uh, was shaped around the defense of uh, the protection of Western Europe, the defense of Israel, the defense of Taiwan, um, and of course, um, the Monroe Doctrine, the refusal to allow any meddling in, um, uh, in, South, in, in any part of the American hemisphere. You can, you can see in the, the 1980s and in the 1990s and indeed the 2000s, uh, the legacy of a great many of the, the, the neoconservatives, um, many neoconservatives who found 
their political beginnings uh, under Richard Nixon, the likes of Dick Cheney, who was mentored by Donald Rumsfeld. Um, they emerge um, in 2000, uh, following the uh, election of George W. Bush, as, as kind of key figures of, um, of influence. Um, but during the, the Reagan years, they were certainly there. Their approach to the, um, the Cold War, the reinvigoration of the Cold War, uh, in the early 1980s, when Reagan refers to the Soviet Union as the evil empire, um, and it becomes um, adamant that the, the Cold War can be won within a generation. The voices in the background are the likes of the, the, Ch uh, the Cheneys, the Rumpfelds, the Wolfowitzes, um, who later find a, a, you know, a much greater post-Cold War scope, which we'll, we'll, we'll come to in, in a moment. The 1990s is, is um, an interesting period of time because in many ways, following the end of the Cold War, uh, and anti-communism was, was an article of faith, obviously, for the, the, the neoconservatives. At the end of the Cold War, there is one part, what one key plank of their, their world essentially crumbles away, the, uh, the, the death of this um, abhorrent regime, this regime that they, uh, they find uh, to be uh, utterly odious. However, um, the 1990s was the, really kind of the high point of America's liberal interventionism. America's intervention in Somalia, America's intervention in Bosnia, America's intervention in Kosovo, um, were the, and um, other um, key moments, particularly the first Gulf War, uh, and then uh, Clinton's kind of undeclared war in 1998 on Saddam Hussein, simply using, using air power. You'd have thought that they would have been happy, but the, um, the partisan nature of, um, the, uh, of the Republican um, Party and, and the, the Republican neoconservatives um, and also the fact that there was um, little kind of ideological um, games to be made, little, um, there, were, there were no Cold War battles to be had, meant that they were fiercely critical of uh, Clinton's interventions and actually um, become more inclined to support a, a kind of a, a more isolationist uh, stance. Um, they, and in, in some ways, they had um, particular geostrategic and uh, geostrategic boogeymen. I mean, the, the one that doesn't go away after the end, the, the fall of the Berlin Wall, is China. And the um, the focus during the 1990s shifts in much neoconservative writing towards the rise of China, and the rise of China being a particularly uh, kind of alarming thing um, as far as kind of American hegemony was concerned. Um, after 9-11, the um, a document that had been circulating called Project for a New American Century um, was dusted off and presented to uh, George W. Bush. And the Project for a New American Century was the kind of the, the post-Cold War thinking of the neoconservative movement. And it's essentially said there are regimes, there's Iran, Iraq, Syria, and North Korea, uh, and there should be um, preemptive wars against these regimes. That now um, America should take uh, a kind of a, a step forward that had not been seen, or a, a, a change of, uh, uh, of emphasis that had not been seen since the Monroe Doctrine. And America was now no longer simply the world's policeman, but it was the, the world's um, crusader in the interests of liberal democracy. This is ostensibly the, the um, uh, this is without reading the subtext. But also, the Project for a New American Century 
in some ways anticipates where America winds up in 2016. It, it was a policy of preemption. It was a policy of waging war against imagined or semi-imagined threats around the world, but it was also a project of resource plunder. Um, one of the reasons why Donald Trump is hated by the American political establishment is because he says the quiet bit loudly. Um, in his, on the campaign trail in 2016, he said, well, why don't we invade Iraq and just take their oil? You know, we'll, we'll just take it off them. Uh, it'll be our oil. Uh, and of course, this has been um, a long, the, the long-standing motivation for American wars in the Middle East um, to acquire um, uh, resources. The value of an ideology like neoconservatism is it can wrap this up in a political kind of packaging, an ideological packaging that said, we are, uh, our role in the world is to spread democracy. Of course, when this happens, um, and you have the likes of Donald Rumsfeld seeing the, the pillaging of Baghdad in 2003, the destruction of centuries or millennia of culture, um, and he said, well, freedom's messy, you know. Uh, and on one level, you know, this sort of glib and um, uh, kind of nihilistic point of view, uh, well, I can't help imagining that on some level he believed that. On some level, there was a belief that freedom is uh, this kind of wonderful thing. I mean, it's a rather kind of intangible concept, and freedom when, uh, when one city is burning to the ground is a... Uh, uh, a, a bit of a debatable point. Um, but freedom itself was worth causing any amount of destruction for. And he takes this almost slightly Lenin-like position of, um, create, of presenting a, a, a glorious, intangible city on the hill type future, but not being able to say, well, when it will be reached and what it will look like when people do, um, which is kind of the the, the, the sort of the standard uh, playbook for uh, ideologues of the world over. So when you reach the um, the, the 2016 uh, election, and there are countless reasons for Trump's success there, um, and too many to go into right now to, to analyze that. One reason, and I do think this is a lesser reason, I think there is a kind of, um, uh, 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 other more, more, more pressing factors based around kind of racial anxieties. But one, one contributory reason is a, a kind of a, a revolt uh, against the, the perceived kind of foreign policy elite in, in Washington. Now, this is not what plebeian America and uh, blue collar America is saying to itself but it's articulating the same thing. People in Washington that started wars in Iraq uh, and Afghanistan and left veterans to come home to a, a life of uh, poverty, problems and suicide. People in Washington who um, shape things in ways that are far beyond the purview of ordinary people. These are the people who are uh, being dealt a kind of the, the middle finger, if you are. So there was something of not a conscious rejection of, of, of neoconservatism in 2016, but the neoconservatives themselves uh, found themselves um, temporarily uh, out of power. Now, I cannot say what is going to happen in the future, but my guess is that the, the Biden years will be a return to um, the, the, the standard model of practice, which you could describe as um, armed interventionism, notionally in the interests of liberal democracy. Perhaps the language that Biden will use will be far more based around um, the interests of American security, it will be far more the playbook, uh, the fearful playbook of the, the Bush and 
Trump era. But um, neoconservatism will continue um, in its own, uh, in, in foreign policy terms at the very least, because we haven't even talked about neoconservative domestic ideas, um, will continue in, in that guise and will continue to be um, uh, carried out in democratic clothing. Anyway, I hope you found that useful and I'll catch you on the next video. Thanks very much. All the best. Bye bye.